So I would like to introduce and invite Helen up. Thank you. Thank you and good evening everybody. So we're here to talk tonight about the flood risk across Christchurch City and as a city built on a low-lying swamp close to the coast, uh, we have quite a number of challenges across the city. Oh, apologies, not speaking close enough. So we have quite a, a number of challenges with flooding across the city and the Christchurch City Council has a variety of roles with respect to flooding. So uh, we have the responsibility for flood protection under the Christchurch Drainage Act. We have responsibility for land use planning under the Resource Management Act. We need to issue permits under the Building Act and they control your floor levels. And of course we have a response function under Civil Defence and Emergency Management Act. So we have quite a broad range of functions and tonight we just want to look at two of those largely. The first around the mechanisms of flooding and some of the engineering responses to that, and the second one around our planning responses under the Resource Management Act. So Tom will present on the mechanisms and the engineering, and then I'll talk to you a little about the planning responses. Thank you. Thanks, Helen, and thank you all for coming along tonight. Uh, my name's Tom Parsons. I'm the... Uh, uh, design manager or technical manager for the land drainage recovery program and we'll talk a bit a bit well I'll talk a little bit more about the land drainage recovery program uh, later on but essentially that's part of council's response to change in earthquake effects across the city I took a bit long this morning when we talked or this afternoon went through this presentation first time round so I'm going to try and get through some of these slides a bit quicker this time um, but uh, I'm here for questions afterwards in case I skip over anything too quickly. There are many different uh, types of flooding in the city. There's sort of three major ones. Uh, the Waimakariri, which responds to snow melt in the Southern Alps, uh, local rainfall event and tidal. So I'll just run through what those uh, sort of scenarios are. The first one, and probably the most largest risk to the city is overtopping or flooding of the WIMAC in a large flood event. Now, uh, control of this type of event is uh, under ECAN's remit. So ECAN uh, manage and construct stop banks along the WIMAC area. They've got uh, currently constructing secondary stop banks to help reduce the risk of this type of potential flood inundation event for Christchurch. Now Christchurch built, is built on the old alluvial flan from the WIMAC, so you can understand that if the water pops out, it could quite easily go through the city. And you can see in this map um, the potential sort of range in inundation should that happen. But as I say, ECAN's got that um, firmly in their sights with the secondary stop bank system. Local rainfall obviously has a major part to play in flooding in Christchurch. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about the different sort of types of rainfall event we get in the city. But this photo of the Flockton Street area from the March event can just uh, give you a glimpse of how widespread flooding can be um, for many residents in the city. The third type of flooding uh, from the sea, or tidal flooding, it's got quite a number of different components and Helen's going to uh, talk a little bit about that later on in her slide, so I won't dwell on that too much, but um, probably to keep in your mind is this type of flooding is an increasing risk in Christchurch with sea level rise. So it is of um, concern for the city and we're responding in a number of different ways. So what does local rainfall look like? Um, this is some rainfall radar images showing uh, intensity of rainfall which fell in February. Now what I wanted to show with these slides is how um, variable rainfall can be. And this was a very high intensity event out um, west in the city and you can see in the bands of the colours here, the darker colours being higher intensity, that it's a very narrow strip of rainfall that occurred and this sort of caused some flooding out in Maidstone Road if I remember correctly. Now uh, another sort of flood event that we had recently was, or rainfall event I should say, was that March event last year. And that had different characteristics. That was um, a longer duration event, it wasn't a high intensity one, and it fell across much of the city. But again, in these images, we can see that the intensity wasn't uniform across the city. There was a lot more rainfall on the Port Hills. 
than there was on the Styx River catchment, for example. And we saw that um, in the flooding response, and the Heathcote responded a lot more than the Styx River. So in any given event, there's a lot of spatial variability in rainfall and, and, and the intensity in rainfall as well, and the catchment responds in different ways to this rainfall. But if we look, uh, we know that flooding is caused by um, high intensity events, very short duration events in localised areas, or more widespread and longer um, duration rainfall events. And this slide here shows um, part of the rainfall record at the Botanic Gardens site. Now the Botanic Gardens rainfall record goes back to the 1800s. This is just the last record since 1961 where we've got a much better uh, rainfall record. And what it's showing in the blue dots is the uh, events of significance that were recorded. And the red dots are events where the duration and depth or total amount of rainfall was such that there was a bit of, uh, bit of flooding in the city in various places. And from the slide you can see that uh, it's not regular. We don't get rainfall or large rainfall events, nor even the flooding events shown in red dots in any uh, sort of regular pattern. We've got clusters of rainfall events and clusters of flood events, say in the 1970s here, a period, a wet year in 1986, a bit of a dry period for about 20 or 30 years, and then we've got another significant wet period in the last couple of years. So um, flooding is obviously rainfall dependent, um, but that rainfall doesn't fall, uh, fall uniformly across the city nor regularly in time. So when rainfall hits the ground, it falls um, into river catchments. And we've got a few of those in the city as well. There's um, the Horsall to the south, we've got the Heathcote River catchment um, in the southern half of the city, the Avon in the middle sticks to the north, and the Otakaikino, which discharges to the Waimak. And you can see here in the slide just the sort of complexity of the network. This is just the open channel network, mind. Um, across the city and the expanse of it. Now there's other things that happen when rainfall hits the ground. If it hits uh, a field or an open space it can soak in a bit better. If it hits uh, hard surfaces such as roads or roofs it runs off a bit quicker. And so human development or, or urban development has quite an uh, influence on how flooding occurs and how catchments respond. And this slide shows us where back in nine, uh, 1850, sorry, the city limits used to extend. You can see it's a very small area, a small, small part of the city, to what is compared now in 2014. And this urban extent has increased imperviousness over that area and um, changed the way that the f rivers respond to rainfall. Obviously, in the last couple of years, there's been some other things going on, most notably the earthquakes and land level change. So that has also influenced flooding and flood risk in Christchurch. This is a land difference map showing um, how the land surface has altered, and it's very complex. There's parts of the city that have come up in the south and parts that have gone down, and they have differing effects on the drainage system, and there can be very localised effects as well. But not only the general land damage, there's also been damage to waterways and bed heave and... Um, bank slumping, there's been damage to the pipe network and reticulation network as well. So um, the earthquake effects have been varied and significant. And one place where those earthquake effects have been um, quite marked is in the Flockton Street area. Now, um, this is a slide showing what's called a digital terrain map or a DTM. The red colours are High elevations and the blues are low. And you can see um, in the Flockton Street area, there's a uh, low depression surrounded by higher land. And, but this light blue is still above the Avon River level. And this was pre-quake. Uh, Post-quake, um, this land dropped and is closer to um, the Avon River 
than was before the earthquake, and so that's increased um, flood risk and what's called reducing the grade through the system. And unfortunately, that's had some catastrophic effects for some of our residents, significant effects. Um, <clears throat> and there are some people within our city who are now suffering from um, frequent flooding. And um, they have reported a range in uh, issues or problems as a result of that frequent flooding. Obviously, the having flood water through your home is a very unpleasant and undesirable thing. Um, some residents have reported health and wellbeing concerns with distresses related with flooding. Um, there's obviously costs and disruption with clean-up and insurances, um, and it has, people have reported delays in their rebuilds as a result of increased flooding. Um, there is a perception of, of reduced property values and, um, and a breakdown in community cohesion can result if people in frequent flooding areas depart. You've obviously got less people on the street and sometimes the community can um, uh, lose some strength. So there's a whole range of responses that Council is um, undertaking to uh, try to respond to this uh, change in flood risk across the city. And there's a framework for um, infrastructure, which I'm going to talk about, and Helen's going to spend um, her time talking about the sort of policy responses to flooding. There is a wider uh, infrastructure, 30-year infrastructure strategy and that is Council's investment in infrastructure, all types of infrastructure across the city and into the future. And in that plan, there's about uh, over $300 million a year spent on infrastructure. Now, that's not all on stormwater, but there's about uh, 45 or $50 million a year the Council has planned to invest in a range of activities relating with stormwater. And that includes uh, pipe reticulation renewals, operations uh, and responses, uh, changes in the network to handle new growth areas, and also um, the Land Range Recovery Plan, or the LDRP, which is um, engineering intervention in response to change and earthquake hazard, which is um, what I'm here today talking about. Um, the other thing, part of uh, Council's response is investigating the the stormwater catchments as a whole, and that is reported through stormwater management plans. And there are a number of stormwater management plans which have been developed or are in development, and that's Council's response to um, not only future development but planning for uh, changes in water quality and quantity and looking at how we might improve water quality with time in our waterways. And they these stormwater management plans do in, um, propose investment. So that's in addition to what the Land Range Recovery Plan may um, identify as physical works. And one example of physical works, well, I'll run through a few examples of um, engineering interventions. Uh, one is the Wollstone Cut that was constructed in 1986 to shorten the length of the Heathcote River and reduce flooding in the lower Heathcote. Um, that had a range of impacts, which is probably a topic in itself, but it is an example of an engineering intervention or something that might uh, would have fallen out of a prior infrastructure plan. Things like the Styx River tide gates, which are designed to keep the tide out of uh, the Brooklands area and the lower Styx floodplain, are another example. Uh, the Avon River stop banks, this photo shows them in about 2011 with, in their uh, after they've been repaired following the earthquakes. So that's sort of a range of different infrastructure that Council invests in to help manage flood risk or flooding. Council's done um, a lot of other work since the earthquakes, and part of that response has been the Merrill Flood Task Force works. This slide shows a number of different works that have been enacted recently um, as part of the task force. The top left-hand side shows... Um, the reconstruction of the Ebtide Street stop bank. Up on the right, there's some new timber lining and drain works that were undertaken in Heathcote Valley. And the bottom photograph shows the uh, pedestrian bridge that was uh, put in place at Guild Street to replace an undersized culvert in the Flockton catchment. 
So those kind of infrastructure investments are there to help reduce flood risk for the residents of Christchurch. Uh, there's also significant investment going on through the SKIRT program. Um, they've constructed or repaired or replaced about 36 kilometres of stormwater piping and rebuilt four pump stations, and that's only um, part of what they have planned. So that skirt work is making good progress. It's really focused on underground stormwater infrastructure. And other sort of things that the Land Range Recovery Program is coming up with is examples of uh, the Dudley Creek scheme, for example, proposing stream widening and um, gravity bypasses, which is currently out to consultation now, and if anyone has any real burning questions about the Dudley Creek, we've got a drop-in session this Saturday uh, at the Shirley Library, so feel free to come along. We'll be there for a few hours. Um, and those sort of schemes uh, have to deal with um, the existing condition. Here are some photos of the Avon River in the March event. And these sort of large infrastructure investments are targeted at reducing the number of floor levels of residents at risk at, through a range of um, different size or magnitude events. And this is a, in the con current consultation document looking at different options and <clears throat> for the Dudley catchment. And it just gives uh, uh, some insight into the sort of magnitude and scale of some of the works that are, are propo currently proposed and um, will be coming up through the Land Range Recovery Programme uh, with time as it continues. It's quite a long program. It's uh, 30 years it's funded through the LTP presently. So that's sort of things that are going on in infrastructure. I'm going to hand over to Helen now to talk about uh, more the policy sort of response that Council's undertaking. So one of the programs that's on at the moment and some of you may have been involved in is we are reviewing our district plan so that is where we control land use to try and reduce the risk and impact of flooding across the whole community. So we also work within the framework of the Building Act and in terms of everyday interactions with councils, you will mostly come across us in a flood context if you are applying for a permit to put up a new house and your floor level will be set above the level of the 1 in 50 flood or if you need a resource consent and you're within one of the flood management areas across the city, then your floor level needs to be set above the level of the 1 in 200 flood. Now, the Building Act also has the, um, the possibility of when a, a property is assessed, if the flood risk is particularly high, there may be a hazard notice put on the house. So there are some options there as well in terms of dealing with that and they are largely around raising the floor levels and dealing with the flooding to land. And those, um, those issues and those options are property spe specific. So if you have any questions about that, it's best to talk directly to our building consent people about the individual properties. In terms of general information that we provide to assist people in working out what new floor levels should be for rebuilds or for, um, for new houses anywhere in the city, we do provide information through the floor level viewer. So if you go on our website and just put in floor level uh, into, the, into the search function, this website will come up and you can access for any individual property what the land level is and what the floor level would be depending on whether it needs to meet the Building Act or the Resource Management Act requirements. So it's a, um, a very well used website for people who are, who are undertaking rebuilds. Now, in terms of um, making some changes across the city through our district plan, Tom talked a little about how we've got impermeable surfaces across the city, and that's exacerbated flooding. And within our older suburbs, this is generally the performance of the drainage network. So small rainfall events, the up to a one in five year event, just disappear into the gutters and down into the stormwater network. Larger rainfall events, the water will run along the roads, and they're designed to do this. So when you see flooding on the road, this can be a very good thing because they're designed to take that sort of overflow uh, water and keep it out of your houses. In very large events, so above a 1 in 50 year event, we do see flooding across properties in um, many areas of the city. 
and in events even greater than that, we do see water entering into houses. And it has to be said that whatever we do engineering-wise, there'll always be a bigger storm. So there will always be flooding in Christchurch, and some of the things that we're doing through our planning rules are to try and address that reality. Now, in new parts of the city, so greenfield subdivisions, we have rules that require developers to deal with water on site. So they have to deal with stormwater on site. They have to capture it, hold it, and then it's released gradually down into, um, into the streams and rivers. So our new developments are performing much, much better than our old ones. Now that's, that's not necessarily, you know, sort of good news for the new people and bad news for people who live in the older suburbs. So the, when new developments come on stream, the council's also taking advantage of that and is retrofitting so that we can deal with the stormwater from the adjacent older suburbs. So this um, Wigram site deals with its own stormwater but also contributes to dealing with stormwater from some of the neighbouring suburbs. Now, in terms of the flood management areas, we've renamed these floor level and fill management areas and mapped them much more extensively across the city. Now, you can't see the detail there, but the detail is all in the district planning maps, but you'll see large amounts of blue mapped across the city. And those are all of the areas that are subject to a one in 200 year flood event. We've gone from mapping around 12,000 of these to now mapping around 53,000 properties affected by these flood management areas. So it just shows you how many properties are low-lying in the city. Now our new modelling of course reflects the updated LIDAR data, so the level of the land. It incorporates one metre sea level rise, which is what we expect over the next 100 years, and we have extended our models right across the city. I mentioned before that we have rules requiring new builds to have higher floor levels, and we also restrict filling, where um, filling would deflect floodwaters in a manner that would exacerbate it for someone else. Now we also control, through these flood management areas, our ponding areas. Now these are naturally occurring storage areas, and we've been looking after these for quite some time and have quite strict rules to maintain the storage capacity so that they can function like this. So this is Henderson's Basin, during a large rainfall, rainfall event, and the water naturally ponds there and then s slowly released down into the river systems. So this is, um, if you like, good flooding. And the, um, the new thing that we've been introducing is the high hazard flood management areas. Now we've already mapped some of these up in the Waimakariri where the, there's a potential for very high and swift flowing waters but we've mapped new areas across the city, and uh, these include the Styx ponding area up in uh, Cranford Basin, which will be familiar to many of you, and Henderson's Basin down in the south. So these are these dark blue areas. So the dark blue areas are, and, uh, sorry, and also sorry, the high hazard areas, the dark blue areas are the ponding areas, and then the light blue is all the usual the, um, flood management areas. So that's just putting it all on one map. Now the next stage of the district plan, which is due to be notified uh, on the 25th of July, we're dealing with the coastal hazards. So that's coastal erosion and the retreat of the shoreline that we expect to see over the next 50 to 100 years. Inundation events, and it's the, we're looking at the 50 and 100 year inundation events, and uh, not forgetting tsunami. So climate change and sea level rise, we've been looking at the latest science on this, and the um, the scientists are predicting up to 0.4 of a metre over the next 50 years and up to one metre over the next 100 years. Now that assumes that emissions continue in terms of business as usual across the world, which seems a fairly safe assumption given the, um, the lack of action at an international level. And we've done some mapping of, first of all, seawater inundation now, seawater inundation is well known to those who live on the coast. This is where we get a low pressure system which effectively lifts the sea, so the, lifts the level of water in the sea, plus the wind effect which drives waves on shore and then all on top of a high tide. So we've mapped those events for a 50 year event with that 0.4 metre sea level rise and then a 100 year storm event with the one metre sea level rise. And we've mapped those 
for the Christchurch coast, but also for Banks Peninsula. So in Christchurch, all of those areas are the same as our flood management areas, which is what we'd expect. But on Banks Peninsula, there are now new areas where there are floor level controls required because of this. And then the second thing we've looked at here, or the scientists have looked at for us, is coastal erosion. And um, those of you who are familiar with the east coast of Christchurch will know that that is an accreting coastline. That is, there's plenty of sediment supply, and that beach is continually building out. Now, it slowly builds out, and then you get a storm that takes a big chunk of it away all at once. But then it slowly builds out again. And at the moment, the sediment supply is such that the slow build-out is, is more than keeping pace with the erosion events. So the, the beach is slowly advancing out to sea. However, somewhere between 50 and 100 years out, the impact of sea level rise, which is trying to push the beach back, will turn that. So we can start to see erosion events and we may start to see a reversal in some parts of that coastline such that the coastline starts to retreat. In terms of what that looks like on the spit, you'll see on the open coast, the coastal erosion areas that have been mapped here are quite narrow. So it's reflecting that accretion erosion balance. But on the estuary side of the spit, where there's no constant supply of sediment, the impact of sea level rise is such that these areas mapped in the, in the light green will start to become tidal areas. So there'll be intertidal mudflats, essentially, within 50 years. And potentially, within 100 years, the darker green areas also will become tidal. In terms of the inundation mapping, I talked about that now going out to Banks Peninsula. So this is the coastal inundation mapped for Akaroa. And you'll see the 50-year um, in the light blue, and then the 100-year event, which is um, taking floodwaters into the, into the township. Last map for you today is the tsunami. So this is the, the modelled, but based on a um, 1968 Peru event, coming either at low tide or at high tide. And you'll see that makes a very big difference to the areas of inundation across the city. And the, um, the red areas are the deeper water, so that's where the water is more than two and a half metres deep in that very large event. Now, we don't have um, land use controls through the district plan as such for this. The response to this is a civil defence response. So we get 10 to 12 hours warning of such an event, so there can be evacuation. And there are sirens along the coast for that. And we're happy to take questions. Thank you.